I, since I wrote this book back in March, I have given many talks, but never to an audience like this. Um, <laughs> so hopefully it'll be an interesting journey for both of us. Uh, this is, in fact, the fifth time I've talked, uh, given a talk this week, and the other audiences have been very earnest. Um, not that I'm suggesting you're not earnest, um, but you have at least, hopefully, had some cocktails, um, which I hope will help you laugh at some of the jokes that I've now put in the talk, because I had this very earnest talk, and when I met the organizers, they explained the setup, and I thought, Lots and lots of data tables and graphs really aren't going to work. Um, so let's see. Um, join me on the journey with this particular talk, um, and we'll see how we get on. The book is called The Gendered Brain, and gendered rather than sexed, and we'll come to that. Um, and it really started because I was interested in understanding how brains got to be different, and one of the most well-established differences, I initially believed, was the differences between male and female brains. Everybody knows that male brains are different from female brains. Decades of research has gone into proving this, and it has all sorts of consequences for the owners of these brains. So, because I was interested not just in the differences between men and women, I really believe that every brain is different from every other brain. And that actually was the origin of the book. I wanted to call it Fifty Shades of Grey Matter, but um, <laughs> the publishers decided that wasn't quite serious enough. Um, so the focus is on what makes brain difference with using males and females as an example. OK. More serious, um, what happens to the owners of these brains? And this is the kind of more earnest bit, um, which I will embed in the talk. But the idea is that there are gender gaps in society. People look at men and women and say they definitely um, behave differently, they certainly achieve differently, they're certainly paid differently, boo. Um, and therefore, we need to understand where those differences come from. And given that I'm, I'm talking in Scandinavia, and I have a very big interest in the underrepresentation of women in science, why don't more women do science when they clearly could? Um, and one of the emerging statistics that people are looking at is look at these amazing Scandinavian countries where uh, the gender gap is the smallest of anywhere in the world, and yet the gender gap in, in science, the underrepresentation of women in science, remains large and is increasing. So there's a kind of paradox there, which, is this something to do with the brain? Are we really saying men's and women's brains, actually they are different, give some different skills, it's an inconvenient truth. So this is really what we're looking at tonight, hopefully. OK, so the argument that I'm trying to unpick is, um, uh, the way in which I've visually displayed it here, is that um, whatever it is, and bearing in mind this argument, as we'll see, has been around for a long time, whatever it is that determines that male anatomy is different from female anatomy, um, and I do know that there is a difference between male and female anatomy. When I've given this talk in the past, sometimes um, certain individuals feel it necessary to send me JPEGs to demonstrate that... Um, <laughs> They are, of course, very small JPEGs, um, <laughs> to, to demonstrate that male anatomy is different from female. OK, so whatever it is that determines <laughs> that male and female anatomy is different, be it their genotype, their hormones, etc., and we'll come back to that, also means that their brains are different. So our brains being different is a biological certainty. Whatever it is that makes us like this also gives us a lady brain or a man brain. And if we have a lady brain, then that gives us what the psychologists have, gen uh, 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 have generously um, produced is a list of the kind of things that a lady brain can do. A lady brain is very good at empathy, understanding people, but pretty rubbish at reading maps. Whereas a man brain is fantastic at all these kind of science-y type skills, spatial cognition as we'll hear, but pretty rubbish at listening, understanding emotion, etc. And that means that with this lady brain, these lady skills, ladies have a certain place in society, um, be it nursing, nursery nurse, carer, etc. 
Whereas the man brain gives you all these amazing skills which will make you a leader of man, winner of the Nobel Prize, etc. So this is the argument that I foolishly decided I'm going to look at this and see if I can unpack it. Now, I would say, um, and I'm hoping, I did think about translating these into Danish, but it didn't really work. I would say as a, as a kind of warning to the audience tonight, um, free platforming, etc., that this isn't a message that has been hugely positively received universally everywhere. So I'll just share with you some of the comments that I've had back when I say, as I will be saying, do you know men's and women's brains really aren't that different? So the Daily Telegraph, a you know, very earnest conservative um, paper in, in the UK, um, had a writer called Christina Rodoni who says, this theory smacks of feminism with an equality fetish. <laughs> so I love the idea that if you're interested in equality, it's some kind of perverse practice. Um, <laughs> The Daily Mail, I don't know if you have the equivalent in, in Denmark, is a, is a bit of a, a rag, um, you know, and a Daily Mail opinion is, is something that people scoff at. So they went straight to the heart of the matter, um, described me as a grumpy... Clearly, I had an agenda. Um, New Scientist, who, which is you know, usually recognised as a very good way of communicating public science, um, when I wrote an article in there, a reader felt it necessary to describe me uh, in these terms. Um, so, you know, people, <laughs> people who speak truth to power, as it has been described, aren't always well received. This is my favourite, and I don't know if it'll work in Danish, we'll see. Um, the Daily Mail... Um, talked about me being full of carp, which I'm assuming was a spelling mistake and, and not a reference to my fish-eating practices. OK. So moving on to more serious things. Are men's brains different from women's brains? This is a very old question, and in fact didn't used to be a question. When it first emerged at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, that the brain was really the organ which determined people's personalities and skills and temperament, etc., the scientists at the time said, right, we need to prove how useful science is in explaining, for example, society. So they looked at society and they said, let's have a look at men's and women's positions in society. Clearly, women are inferior. And this was actually an accurate description of their position at the time. They, they had no financial rights, educational rights, property-owning rights, didn't have the right to vote, etc. So they said, well, women are inferior, must be because their brains are inferior, um, and therefore we'll find a way of demonstrating that inferiority. And I use that term advisedly, because that is exactly the, the term that they used. So we have... Um, so I go back to this. Uh, we have that um, women represent the most inferior forms of human evolution and are closer to children and savages than to an adult civilized man. Whereas uh, Le Bon, a male researcher at the time, uh, did acknowledge that occasionally you got bright women, but they were so rare they were equivalent to a two-headed gorilla. Um, that was the other title I wanted to call the book, The Problem of the Two-Headed Gorilla, but Again, it got overruled. So really what we're looking at here is ways that scientists then devised to demonstrate that um, women's brains are inferior. Remembering, of course, that at this stage, we couldn't actually look at brains. You could look at dead brains, uh, the consequences of diseased or damaged brains, but you couldn't actually examine what a brain was doing in an intact living human being solving a problem, for example. That came later. But that didn't stop the scientists theorizing about what the brain was for and how it worked and who had an inferior one. So, for example, as was mentioned in the film earlier, you could fill an empty skull with bird seed and weigh the bird seed and make some kind of guess at the size of the brain that had been in the skull. Scientists got really excited because they discovered that on average, and that's an important message to bear in mind, men's brains were about five ounces heavier than women's brains. As so often in this type of discussion, size matters. And therefore, they decided that this was the reason men were superior, their brains were bigger, and that's clearly where superiority came from. And then some spoil sport pointed out that actually sperm whales and elephants and quite a lot of other animals have bigger brains than human males, and generally, <laughs> they're not usually thought of as, as more intelligent 
Um, so then they started to devise a whole load of different metrics, looking at the size of the brain as a ratio of the size of the body, etc. And uh, weird things like uh, phrenology, measuring head bumps, craniology, looking at the thousands of different angles between your earlobe and your nose to try and guess uh, what kind of brain your skull contained. But the important thing to bear in mind is that the aim of this metric was to prove a point. It wasn't just to, you know, to generate some data that you could look at. The point was that they wanted these measures to prove that men, white, because it intersected with race science as well, white, upper-class, male, educated individuals were at the top of any scale that such metrics could measure. If, by any hapless chance, they found a measure where a woman came out top, so clearly there was something wrong with the measure. And that's important to bear in mind. I'm not saying we're anything like as, as um, uh, politically motivated in the measures we use in science today, but you have to remember that science has a history, and sometimes that history is colored by politics. And so we got these measures generated which proved that women were inferior for whatever reason, because their angle of their earlobe to their nose put them lower down the scale. And what they wanted then to show was that there were women and children after men, then came lower classes, and then came other races. So this was really the history of, of, of this kind of um, study. OK, need to move on. It is an old question, but it's something that you know, perhaps the size of the audience today, I'm not immodest enough to assume it's just because it's me. Um, there are a few certainties in science, but I'm pretty certain that despite all of your cocktails, everybody here has got a brain. So it's something that we're all interested in. But what's interesting is that the interest still expresses itself in this hunt the difference agenda, as I've called it. So whenever I know as a neuroscientist, whenever there, I see a paper um, which has a whiff of a sex difference, you know, a tiny little measure somewhere has demonstrated that on average um, a male part of the brain is bigger than a female part, you know that in a few weeks' time there will come out in the popular science press a headline which is always something like this, men's and women's brains, the truth, or proof at last. So there is a very powerful inbuilt belief that definitely men's and women's brains are different. If scientists can't agree how they're different, then there's something wrong with the science. There is a truth out there that we're looking for. Okay, so this is the kind of argument which is very prevalent, which is really generated by these early researchers, and which still informs a lot of how we think today, a lot of how our children are educated, a lot of how diversity initiatives are produced. And that is, we're, uh, male brains are different from female brains because they're born different. So we might have uh, two little brains here, one of them already arriving in the world with some of those key skills, the other one pretty pink, but not with you know, very useful skills at the first stage. So the idea is that biology is destiny. These brains are due to grow up, to acquire more skills, to eventually arrive at a developmental endpoint which was fixed and inevitable, which meant that brain, the owner of that brain, um, was fit to be a Nobel Prize winner, possibly prime minister, president. There are differences, but you know, we won't go into those now. Um, the idea is that having a male brain gave you that kind of skill. Whereas the female brain, which I've cheekily colored pink, um, got bigger, but didn't necessarily acquire the necessary skills. In fact, in the 19th century, it was felt that if you tried to give the woman the necessary skills by educating her, you could damage her brain and certainly her reproductive system. An educated woman could suffer from a condition called anorexia scholastica, which meant that she would be unable to reproduce. Um, so education, a dangerous thing for this, this fragile uh, little organ. Um, and gradually it got bigger um, and then arrived at a developmental endpoint, very different from this one, um, possibly like pink, very emotionally labile, 21st century like being a princess, etc. So the idea is that this is the kind of essentialist story um, which underpins, and obviously I'm characterizing or caricaturing it, underpins a lot of our, our thinking. Okay, 
There are books to prove this, um, and I'll come back to the role that books and literature and popular communication plays in this belief. So there's a book called The Male Brain, which proves there is such a thing, another one called The Female Brain. I'll come back to these books a bit later, because I have a reputation for being quite rude about them. So I'll just present them to you at the moment. Um, and this is the, the kind of granddaddy of them all. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Brains are so different that they could almost come from different planets. Right. Remembering these theories had been produced um, before, as I said, we could actually see the brain uh, in situ. In the 1990s, we started to get brain imaging, and this is the kind of uh, techniques that I'm working with, uh, working in different areas. And you can produce um, these amazing images, which give you structures. They can show where patterns of activation are changing in different parts of the brain. You can look at pathways in the brain. You can even color code neurons to respond differently to light, so you get these wonderful pictures. There was a big industry, and I think this is interesting for those of you who are artists as well. All of a sudden, scientists were saying, we've got these amazing data. How are we going to communicate them to people? Because what we're really looking at is tiny little nerve cells chattering away to each other, producing tiny, weeny little magnetic fields or electric, electricity changes. We want people to see these changes to understand them. And so you started to get signal processors and artists working together, producing these amazing images, which were part of a solution because we started to understand how the brain worked, but also part of the problem because they were a bit simple and people could adapt them or adopt them and say, oh, I know how the brain works. There, there's the God spot in the brain. There's somebody thinking about God. Look, you know, there's a part of the brain that's lit up. And the consequence of the ease of the communication of these images was that we got a wave of books like this, the female brain, Mars, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I'm not trying to sell you this, I'm just drawing your attention to it. And saying, hey, look, you know, we've been saying for years, you know, our, our um, uh, lucrative industry as self-help gurus has been based on telling you that men and women are different. And here at last, we've got these amazing images we can illustrate our books with, we can quote their research and tell them that, you know, men are rubbish at language and, and women are really articulate, etc." And it's interesting, if any of you are interested in science communication, and I have said that the organizers needn't worry, I'm going to get you sued. I have said this in, in public before. This book in particular is a real doozy. It's full of the most rubbish science that you've come across. Um, it's actually, if, it, you know, if you shouldn't be taking it seriously, it's hilarious. You know, making quotations, it looks good. It looks very sciencey. It refers to science research, and you go in the back, and there's a, a paper quoted. It's not until you read something like, you know, women are much more articulate and able to uh, be in contact with their emotions than men, and, you know, that then goes on for a whole load of explanations. You look at the paper that's quoted, and it's actually on songbirds, and you think, hmm, that could tell us a lot about songbirds, but I'm not sure it's really useful information for human relationships. And I'm afraid... Science in this area is very often characterized by these sort of mistakes. So I very rudely... Um, called all of this kind of books neurotrash. And neurotrash is a problem because the books are out there, people read them, it informs their stereotypes, very often it sustains their stereotypes because we have a kind of confirmation bias that if you read something which believes, you know, agrees with something you already believe in, you think, fantastic, this, this author really knows what they're, they're talking about. Um, so neurotrash is a problem. Another sort of problem, I'm afraid, is um, scientists themselves who carried on. You'd think, now you've got all this brain imaging equipment, and you can really look at individuals with an intact human brain, lying in a scanner, solving a, whatever task you give them to do. Um, you'd think they'd start with a blank slate. Let's forget this idea that women's brains are inferior or any way different. Let's just have a look at brains and see how they work. But no, the, the hunt, the difference agenda continued. And you started to get books by scientists um, who were talking about the essential difference. And I think essential is an interesting word, because in, in this context, it really means of a biological essence, claiming that whatever your biology was, it gave you particular kind of 
profile or portfolio of skills. But if I'd stopped any of you coming in here tonight and said, what, what do you think essential means? You'd probably say, really, really important, something we have to have. So it's another area where you know, we have to be careful, language, language matters. The opening phrase uh, of the book, the female brain is hardwired for empathy, and I've underlined hardwired, because that's another concept which is used a lot, because it means whatever it is we've got in our heads is fixed, it's determined. You can't change it um, however much you'd like to, um, and therefore it's a kind of internally uh, generated issue. So the female brain is hardwired for empathy. So quotes female brain, there must be something, it's hardwired, good at empathy. Um, whereas the male brain is hardwired for understanding systems. So that's a very clear statement. Later in the book he says, you don't have to be a woman to have a female brain, or you don't have to be a man to have a male brain. And I don't know if you share my unease with that when you think, so why are we talking about male and female brains? And I think, again, that's really important, because, of course, male brain for you means brain from a man, female brain from a woman. And again, we're talking about sustaining stereotypes. So I you know, need to draw your attention to the fact that um, language in this area matters, and as I'm coming on to say, what's in the outside world is very powerful in determining what happens to our brains, and that can include this kind of language. So just again, very briefly, I won't be going through this in detail, but just to say that the Hunt the Difference agenda continued. And an impression that is given, particularly if journalists want to write an article about sex differences in the brain, or gender differences in the brain, we'll come back to that. Um, they'll, they'll quickly look at titles in, in journal articles or maybe even abstracts. They won't go into detail in looking at the papers, but they'll come across reference to the fact that women, supposedly this part of the brain um, in, in women's brains is bigger, joins the right side of the brain to the left side of the brain, and this gives them all kind of emotional linguistic skills. Um, or, for example, um, the ratio of the, the cell bodies in the brain to the connections between them are different between males and females, or particular parts of the internal structure of the brain are different. So we're still getting this big emphasis on looking for structural differences between the brains. There's two things. First of all, and I have to confess, this is a practicing neuroscientist, and you might wonder what we're spending all your money on. We don't actually know for sure what the significance of any kind of structural difference is in terms of function or what these, the owner of that brain can do. Does having a bigger amygdala mean you're more emotional? Does having a bigger amygdala mean you've experienced more emotion? All of these are hypotheses which we haven't really studied or we don't know the answer to. So when the world is full of, you know, science says, we need to bear in mind that it may well be describing some differences, the other thing I would say is, if you again look at all the different papers, one lot of papers will find a difference in one part of the brain. Next month, another paper will say, oh, we looked at that part of the brain, didn't find any differences, but we did find a difference in this part of the brain. So looking for differences, I think anyway, is sending us down a not very useful rabbit hole, but there isn't even any consistency in the differences that are being found. And a big issue that's only fairly recently come to light, and it's the old size matters issue again, is that if you actually correct <laughs> for uh, the difference in size, on average, there is one sex difference. Male brains are about 10% bigger than female brains. On average, you get bigger lady brains and smaller man brains, um, but on average, they're bigger. But that's because, on average, men are bigger they are, on average, 10% bigger. They also have bigger hearts, livers, kidneys, because it's all a kind of scaling issue with respect to the body that's carting these things around. And we haven't, as far as I know, maybe you have, had very earnest talks on sex differences in the kidney or sex differences in the liver. So it's important to bear that in mind. OK. So in terms of the question, are women's brains different from men's brains? As a practicing neuroscientist, I have to say, I don't know. I'm sure there are key biological differences with respect to hormone receptors, etc. But with respect to the kind of structures I'm interested in, in what determines behavior, I can't look at those two scans and say, the one on the left is a man, the one on the right is a woman. I don't know. 
Um, and I could have a pretty good guess, perhaps, if I had some other context around it. I couldn't take any of you in the audience, and I couldn't take, say, a bunch of females. I'll put you in my scanner. I know what the brain's going to look like. Couldn't take males. I'm going to put you in the scanner and know what your brain is going to look like. So again, when we have this impression that scientists have found all these differences between males and females, it is an illusion. It's a myth. And that's really important because, again, it's something that people say, well, of course, there's no point me giving my female employees the same training as my males, because their brains are different. And that is something which was said less than six weeks ago by Ernst and Young accountants. I don't know if anybody works for them, but anyway, might like to update them at some point. Okay. Okay, so I've said there doesn't seem to be any meaningful differences between men's and women's brains, but we still have these kind of gender gaps. We have people will say, I know that men are behave differently from women, they achieve differently, etc. So the rest of the talk will be um, talking about um, where this might come from. And this is really the message in my book, which is looking at the world as a brain influencer. My belief, and um, I'm an autism researcher by day, um, and it's really interesting how different individuals with supposedly the same label, experience the world differently, how differently the world impacts on different brains. So I have a very strong belief that the world is a brain influencer. We really need to look at what's in the outside world and how it affects the brain, as well as understanding any kind of internal biology. And I, that is the message of the book, and in fact, the take-home message, um, if any of you are flagging, um, that I'm going to give you this evening, is that a gendered world produces a gendered brain. And this is really the outcome of 21st century neuroscience. New findings, new understandings about what our brain does, how it works, and what it's for. Two things we need to understand. Just how hardwired are our brains? We have this idea that there's some kind of developmental trajectory, which I showed you earlier, but eventually it reaches an end point, and we have an organ which is wired up, like soldered together in a particular way, and that organ is going to take us through life, help us to achieve things, or cause us to fail at things, um, until we reach the end of our life. But now we know, and that's great news for everybody, that our brains are very plastic and flexible throughout our lives. So the experiences our lives have will actually, throughout our lives, will change our brains. All the experiences we don't have, or the experiences we're discouraged from having, will have an effect on our brains. And this, I think, is, for me, one of the primary issues in understanding that the world our brains are moving around in are actually impacting and changing those brains in quite a self-fulfilling prophecy sort of way. So this um, example here is classic study done on taxi drivers in London, and they have to go through a really complicated um, uh, skill-acquiring system called the knowledge. Um, and that means they have to learn and understand and remember and plot at different times of the day 20,000 routes within six miles of Charing Cross. I'm not quite sure how they determined that was necessary. Um, but it takes a, a huge amount of effort, three or four years on average. Lots of people fail. Some take as many as six years. But what's interesting is that researchers have tracked the changes in taxi drivers' brains from before they did the knowledge, while they're acquiring the knowledge, while they're practicing as taxi drivers, and interestingly, when they retire. And they've shown that there's parts of the brain which change, become more active, become enlarged, so there is a size matters issue here. Um, when they're practicing as taxi drivers, they become amazing, amazingly skilled at this particular hugely complicated task, and parts of their brain have changed. But when they retire, those differences disappear. So our brains will wax and wane according to the kind of um, experiences that they're exposed to. And this is an example I give, um, particularly in girls' schools, um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, playing Tetris, for example, video games, are actually really good for developing spatial skills. I give talks in schools, and you can see the teachers rolling their eyes when I'm saying, you know, 
video games are a great way of training and improving spatial skills. So you don't have to do lots and lots of geometry in order to become a better geometrician. Um, you could just play Tetris. Um, and this is neuroscience proof of that. So girls at the beginning um, were struggling with spatial skills. At the end, there were certain changes in the brain, and if you subtract one from the other, you can see there's quite marked areas where big differences had occurred as a function of this training, and interestingly, their spatial cognition improved. So the kind of things we do, even if they're video games, will actually change our brain. The other thing we need to bear in mind is that our brains are actually... Sorry, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Our brains are quite sensitive little creatures. Um, and they're not just kind of vacuum-packed information processing organs. They will also vary according to the context um, of a, a task that they're given to do. So they're quite sensitive. There's a social psychology phrase called um, stereotype threat, which is really to say if you're um, a member of a, mi a minority group, for example, which has a reputation for not being particularly good at a task, um, and you're put in a situation where that task is being tested, and your membership of that minority group is drawn to your attention, very often you will underperform on that task. And this is a study done where we looked at um, uh, a spatial task, one of those kind of sciencey spatial tasks, which were given to three groups of women. Um, one group had the negative message. This is a, a task that women aren't very good at, but not to worry. Just want to see what happens when I put you in the scanner. So put them in the scanner, give them the spatial task. Another group had a neutral message. Third group had a positive one. This is a, a spatial task. Think of it as a perspective-taking task. Women are actually very good at this task. So um, I just want to see what happens in the scanner. OK, so the pattern of errors followed the messages they'd been given, bearing in mind this was exactly the same task for each group. So the ones with the negative message made the most mistakes, ones with the positive made the least mistakes. What was interesting was that the pattern of brain activity reflected the kind of social context. So the ones who were given the positive message, the appropriate areas of the brain, the kind of spatial processing areas of the brain were activated, whereas the people who had the negative message, the areas of the brain which were activated were less appropriate for the task in hand, but more appropriate for people monitoring errors or getting emotional um, negative feedback if they made a mistake, etc. So the brain doesn't just solve a problem, it also listens, if you like, to the, to the context in which the um, problem is presented. Okay, now this brings us, in fact, to the heart of the talk. Um, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, but it's really to demonstrate where, how we got to this idea that our world is having a major impact on us as human beings and us as human beings who own plastic, permeable, flexible brains. Most of the research that cognitive neuroscientists like me did in the past, or are still doing, is looking at the cognitive skills that the, the evolutionary youngest part of our brain gave us. The idea that this is the part of the brain largest proportionally in humans, the secret of the success of the human race. So we focus on problem-solving skills, you know, Sherlock Holmes-type cool information processing, solving, or science, again, somebody like Einstein, creativity, artistic, music, language, etc. But there is another human process which is emerging as possibly even more important than the kind of cognitive skills we acquired, and that is the fact that we're social. Social Human beings have the largest number of, of collaborative networks of any other species, um, and the largest groups within those networks. We use them much more, we solve problems collaboratively, um, we form groups much more easily, we form different groups, um, and we belong to different groups. And the kind of social science that I and my colleagues have been doing is really to do with how can we model that and understand how the brain actually makes us social. In other words, understands what's going on in the outside world. And it gives us a very powerful sense of self, a sense of identity, a whole range of um, other sort of social skills, including understanding social norms, responding to them differently. If you were a girl, how would you do this? If you were a, saw this word, do you think it's a male word or a female word, etc.? 
Understanding stereotypes, responding very strongly. However we like to think we're unbiased or above stereotypes, we do respond in a stereotypical way. Sometimes being aware of this means it'll stop us and we can overcome this. But um, we need to bear in mind that our brains are all the time monitoring stereotypes. Now, this is important because there is a part of our brain, and this is where I do most of my work, in the kind of traffic light system in the brain, or the go-no-go -no -go process, which is really like a braking system. It interacts a lot with this group here, um, the evolutionary oldest and supposedly most primitive part of the brain, which we haven't actually evolved away from. It still determines, emotions still determine our cognitive processes, but also our social processes. We seek positive social experiences, which I hope you're having tonight. We avoid negative social experiences, which I hope you're not having tonight. And it's this part of the brain which actually determines this. And it's quite inhibitory, and that's important to remember, because it means that if, for example, the brain's owner makes some sort of social faux pas or is making a decision based on joining a group where there doesn't seem to be too many people that belong, uh, or who are like them, or who are, or who are likely to welcome them, etc., that will give them negative feedback. And the brain will be saying, do you know what? I think you should take a different route. And hopefully you're starting to see how I'm um, discussing how the brain um, can change depending on the social context. I'm just looking at the time here. I can't remember what time we started, so hopefully I'm all right for time. Um, OK, again, I'm not going to go into this in detail. You'll be pleased to hear. But these are the kind of findings that people like myself and other labs have been demonstrating to look at, for example, self-esteem, which is the kind of metric which measures how good we feel about ourselves, how good we feel about the choice we made, the activities we're involved in, our interaction with other people, whether or not we feel we've been rejected. And this is um, you know, modelled by a very simple little video game where two little individuals are throwing the ball to each other and you pop up as an avatar and they start to throw it to you and they laugh when you, you know, drop it and cheer when you catch it. Um, and I've actually done this task in the scanner. And you lie there thinking, this is just a video game. But you can get really quite miffed when these two little figures stop playing with you. And if you're monitoring your self-esteem, as your colleague is getting you to do, your self-esteem does go down. So these are all tasks which have a negative effect on our self-esteem. And they're all social tasks. They're all to do with how other people view us or what kind of mistakes we make, etc. Now, what's really important in terms of understanding how powerful this is as a brain process, so this is really where we're getting away from the nature versus nurture argument. We're saying, do you know these two processes are so entangled, we shouldn't be thinking about them as two different processes. The important thing to realize is the area of the brain which is activated which is the little traffic light system, actually, that I've been showing you, is associated with a plummeting drop in self-esteem, but it's also the same area of the brain which is activated when we experience real pain through some kind of chronic illness or injury, etc., which you can also, or electric shock if you've got an unkind colleague who's trying out pain thresholds. Um, so it's a very powerful social driver. So our brain will drive us away from anything which has negative consequences, could be cognitive, but it could also be social. OK, so this is really, um, hopefully <laughs> you'll be pleased to hear, the closing stages, when I'm saying, OK, things in the outside world will change the brain. And the most recent aspect, I haven't been looking at sex differences. But what I really want to just finish off with here is saying, well, is there any evidence that the world treats boys and girls differently? Um, and we could stop here and generate different lists, etc. But what I'm actually going to talk about is just very briefly three specific examples I feel are really useful in trying to understand the kind of gender gaps that I mentioned at the beginning. Oh, I keep bringing that book up. I don't know why I'm really drawing your attention to it. I'm hoping your traffic light system in the brain is stamping it away. OK. Right, so first of all, one of the things I've been studying is very is young children, but there's also increasing evidence that tiny babies arrive in the world not as the helpless, 
uh, hapless individuals that we thought. They arrive as highly tuned, with highly tuned little social radar. They are picking up right from the beginning uh, the kind of cues in the outside world, the clues in the outside world, that there are people out there who are treated differently by society, who are different from themselves or the same as themselves. And this starts within hours of birth. So knowing this, is it the case that babies get treated differently by the outside world? Well, I have to say, this is, there's a big rant in my book about this, and I don't know, have any of you heard of gender reveal parties? Yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Actually, two things. First of all, they're not gender reveal parties, they're sex reveal parties, but we'll come back to that. So, <laughs> so you get, I only discovered these in writing the book. I was actually looking for, and I hope there's no card manufacturers, those ghastly, it's a girl, it's a boy cards. And I came across gender reveal parties, which, if you don't know, uh, 20 weeks before a human being arrives in this world, there is a party into which whatever box they're subsequently going to put is announced to that world. So you go to a party, presumably bearing expensive gifts, um, and there's a cake which you cut open, and it's either pink or blue, or you get uh, invitations which talk about touchdowns or tutus, um, ruffles or rifles, etc. Um, so it's it's it's. I mean, people say, you don't really think that's going to change a baby's brain. And I said, no, but it's a very powerful indication of how society codes that difference and how important it is. And just to share with you, I hope you haven't had your supper too recently, I've just come across this most recently, and that is you can have a gender reveal lasagna. So you can, <laughs> you can actually dye the cheese sauce, either pink or blue. Actually looks disgusting, but anyway, whatever. So, I mean, just to say, yes, there's lots of examples and, and I say, welcome to the world of pointlessly gendered products, because it's not just about children, although they are clearly a very good target audience for them and for their parents. So a whole load of very early on messages that boys and girls are different. So we need, probably need to move on. Um, and I, I think that's, that's important. This is important too, I think, for another reason, and this is where I hope the kind of Danish audience, this is the Lego story, okay. So, um, when is a sex difference not a sex difference? And could it be related to the idea that people have differently, different gendered training opportunities? And this is a task I've, I've talked a bit about, a, a task of a concept about men being better at spatial tasks. And this is a classic example of this task, a mental rotation task, two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. You have to kind of mentally the question is, is this the same as that, but just rotated to a certain number of angle, uh, degrees? So you have to mentally image that and rotate it in your head and say it's the same or different. And I won't give you the answer, because stereotypically, I'm really bad at it. B but I am brilliant at parallel parking, so it's not a kind of one-size-fits-all. I, I, of course, never dare parallel park in public ever again. But um, OK, so this is renowned. It's supposedly one of the most robust sex differences. Um, big study done in the States four years ago, which said, um, yes, we've done a whole range of these tasks. On average, men are better than women. Then they said, well, let's have a look at the kind of spatial experience they've had. They looked at toys they played with. Did they play with construction toys? What kind of sports did they play? Did they involve spatial skills? Uh, what kind of hobbies did they have, etc.? Once they got this kind of spatial awareness, spatial training opportunity measure, and factored it into the data analysis, the sex difference disappeared. So what looked like a sex difference was just the fact that the world had offered these individuals different training opportunities. And the reason I'm talking to you about this is because I think boys and girls have different training opportunities. This is the classic Lego pattern, very, very similar to a sort of spatial orientation task, mental rotation task. Mario, another a uh, game that teachers hate me talking about because it's a very good spatial training task and it has been shown to change the brain. But these are both tasks which are stereotypically more commonly played uh, or toys given to boys or that boys play with. But people say, but that's not fair. You know, girls play with these kind of toys too. So just draw your attention to the fact that girls, Lego for girls is slightly different. <laughs> Big blocks, Lego friends, anybody? Um, what can they build with their Lego friends? They can build hairdressing salons, etc. But this is my absolute favorite, and this is STEM Barbie. So 
Mattel, knowing that there's an underrepresentation of women in science, produced Engineer Barbie, okay, who has very short lab coat, even shorter miniskirt. It has got DNA. <laughs> It has got DNA patterns on it, so it's sort of sciencey, scary high heels. But this is the killer. What can STEM Barbie make? Because you want to show that she's an engineer, she can construct things, so her experience of construction will be the same. She can make a pink washing machine, <laughs> um, a pink jewelry carousel, and I, I, think, I think there's a pink table for cutting out patterns on, on, on for dress patterns, etc. So I would submit that boys and girls do have different training experiences, and this will be significant for what looks like a sex difference, which people might say, that's inbuilt, it's invariable, and I'll say, actually, no, look at these kind of things. Now, I'm going to move swiftly through the next, which is really talking about different educational opportunities. Um, I've been working quite hard with the early years movement in the UK looking at stereotypes in the classroom. I was involved in a BBC programme some time ago called No More Boys and Girls. And it was really frightening going to a class of seven-year-olds, looking at how much stereotyping, completely unconscious, there was in the classroom, how the children were treated, teacher called the girls sweet pea, the boys mate. Um, each of those on their own, not necessarily going to make a huge difference, but it's still a message that I'm different because, you know, I'm a sweet pea or I'm a mate, etc. Um, and looking at evidence of the effects of stereotyping very early on in life. Um, six-year-old girls or six-year-old children being given a choice of toys to play with, one set of toys for really, really clever people, one set of toys for people who worked really hard. Many fewer girls chose the really, really clever toys because they didn't think they were really, really clever. Six-year-olds, okay? So this, you know, these stereotypes are important to be aware of um, and to see how they could be changing uh, our children's brains and, and subsequently uh, the brains that they're going to carry through life. And this just finally is a representation of what I think um, is the basis of a lot of the underrepresentation of women in science. And that's not because women don't have the skills or they have biologically determined different presence, uh, preferences. It's because science is not a very welcoming place for women of the female persuasion. Females, they don't think there are certainly evidence that science is, is pretty misogynistic. And this is one of our greatest scientists of all time, Charles Darwin, who had very clear, uh, one of the greatest misogynists of all time, as it turns out, very clear views about the inferiority of women. And you think, okay, so that's 150 plus years ago, we've moved on. And yet, this rogues gallery here are all male scientists who, within the last 15 years, have come up with statements that Larry Summers saying that there wasn't, um, there was different availability of aptitude, that's why we didn't get um, female geniuses, Nobel Prize winners, etc. James Damore, writer of the Google Memo, saying Gen uh, Google was wasting its time on gender diversity issues because the distribution of preferences and abilities of men and women differ in part, kindly, due to biological causes. And Alessandra Strumia, a physicist who last year before last now stood up in um, CERN in Switzerland and said physics shouldn't be wasting its time on educating or encouraging women in physics because biologically they were not suited for the demands of physics. Okay, so you could say, bearing in mind that we know that self, the loss of self-esteem is um, it does change our brain in a particular way. If you're confronting a culture which has these particular views of you, then, then you might choose to go into a different culture, and that may be where the gender paradox is coming from. And I won't go into these in detail, but again, these are kind of comments about even if women get into science, then their achievements are treated differently. So um, it's expected, those sciences, sciences, there are sciences which believe that in order to achieve greatness, you have to be born to be great. And it's those sciences that have the biggest gender gaps. Just a correlation, I'll just leave it out there, but I think it's significant. And similarly, um, if you, two individuals, one of them, Hedy Lamarr, a very famous film star, um, lovely story about she teamed up with a male engineer to solve um, a problem of scrambling images in the war. Um, 
both of them worked equally hard and solved an amazing problem, which is actually the basis today still of encryption of our, our, our data. Um, her work has been generally described as in what's called lovely terms, seed terms. Um, so the idea is that you know, she nurtured something very carefully, worked very hard, uh, had a big team around her, whereas George Antill, um, his idea was a light bulb. It was a moment of genius. So two individuals working together solved the same problem, got different acknowledgments. Okay, so take home message. Brains reflect the lives they've lived, not just the sex of their owners. So if you've got different training opportunities, your brain will be changed. Similarly, a gendered world, and I mean a world full of gender stereotypes, will produce a gendered brain. So maybe the differences that you're looking at here are not because they're born different, because brains are made different. So there is this big interaction between what's going on. So after having shown you all these amazing brain images, I came across this lovely picture from a six-year-old. Um, and I think that's a really important message to remember. Everybody's brain is attached to the world. So finally, and this is a demonstration that I have been, um, a lot of these events have been at book selling opportunities. I'm not trying to sell you books, but it's just to sell you thoughts, okay? You have a choice, okay? So... <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can still believe in the essentialist, essential nature of differences, and you know, obviously I'm characterizing it in a particular way, but there are people who think this is really important. I'm accused being full of carp, social engineering, <laughs> etc. Um, or hopefully you could remember this message and this book. And just finally, hopefully no booksellers in the audience. My, my students wanted to help out with this activity, so they wanted to generate some stickers that they could go into bookshops and put on books. So again, I can't possibly comment, so I'll just leave these out here. And it'd be an interesting understanding of this translates um, it's in English. But, so they wanted a sticker like this for these books. Um, <laughs> and hopefully, a sticker like that for this book. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>